class and they're on their way. So there'll be some people trickling in once we get started. But um, I wanted to thank you all for coming out. I want to thank you for being here and, and go up hearing what Dr. S Dr. Crawford has to say about uh, healthcare simulation technology, which is what this new program we're putting together is all about. And I hope that after this is done, you have a clearer picture of what we do, why we do it, what we need, when we do it, and what the expect expectations are of the graduates from this program. Uh, Dr. Crawford, I met him uh, several years ago at the Synghost Conference in San Antonio. Uh, I hosted that conference in 2013, and that's where I first met him. It was a strange encounter the first time I ever saw him. He's so studious of everything. And, he was creeping around in my lab with a video camera, you know, just filming everything. He'd get down and look, he'd look at this, and he'd look at this. I, I just saw him there, he was with someone else. I thought, who is this guy, you know? But the more I got acquainted with him, the more I understood about him and, and got to know him and, and seeing his involvement in everything that he does and is part of, I've come to realize he's probably one of the foremost authorities in the world on this particular topic. So we're privileged to have him. I'm glad he's here. And uh, if you have any questions, uh, feel free to ask. Um, he will be available for a while after this is over if you have anything you want to talk to him about or ask him. And ju just feel free. Just relax, eat, drink, be merry. And, and with that, <laughs> I'll give you Dr. Scott Crawford. Hi, thank you very much for that uh, introduction. I'm going to be talking to you about uh, healthcare simulation operations and kind of what it entails in its larger sense. Uh, now this talk is here just for you, so feel free to raise your hand, interrupt, um, get clarification. Uh, this talk is part of uh, one that I've given um, a couple of other locations um, and we'll be giving next week in Singapore as part of a larger conference there. Um, but it's, a, a, I think, a very good overview of what is involved with simulation operations and the either technology specialist or um, uh, operations specialist uh, role that is involved behind the scenes. So I'm going to just kind of move forward a little bit here. Um, again, it's part of a larger talk, so I just want people to know I don't have any other specific financial um, uh, gain from any of the stuff that I'm talking about here. Um, I am a emergency medicine physician by, by training and work 70% uh, of my time clinically still in the hospital. And the other portion of that time, I work in the simulation center providing uh, graduate and undergraduate medical education as well as uh, simulation and scenario design. But I got my start with simulation technology as a sim tech, as a simulation specialist, um, brought in immediately after residency to help get the sim program at our uh, institution up and running for graduate medical education. So my first month or two as a uh, attending physician, my workspace was mostly microphones, networking cables, uh, mixing boards, and electrical wiring. So it was not quite a, a normal uh, start to a medical career. But um, I have a diverse background uh, that led me into this role. So my undergraduate training was in physics. I uh, got my EMT certification and then went on to medical school. But while in college, I worked as a computer technician. I also worked as a uh, DJ uh, doing uh, parties and events um, in the evenings. and. Uh, would also help at my brother's um, music store. So I have a, uh, a background in audio, in IT, um, and it is a very diverse role that really excels in simulation technology. And so that's what I'm gonna sort of point out here. Um, so I want you to understand how big this really is in terms of what the expectations and background are for those individuals um, working in the field. Uh, kind of discuss the technologies that we are using to help with uh, healthcare education, and then um, looking at those technologies, figure out how we can innovate and improve upon them, and what it means for how we deliver education, uh, both for healthcare but also across the board for uh, graduate education um, in in the world. 
and how those pieces are put together. So starting off with what is operations? So it is all of the technical and logistical needs needed to get a program sustainable, functioning, and running. Um, so as a, as a physician and as a uh, healthcare educator, I want to be able to walk into the classroom, into the simulation lab, and begin teaching and providing educational opportunities to the students. That means that everything needs to be set up and running before I even get there. And there is so much that happens behind the scenes for something like that to occur that I take for granted if I have not had to do it personally. So one of the pieces um, that we need to look at is the personnel, the processes, uh, and the infrastructure that's required to be able to have that look smooth and seamless for the learner and for the educator because they don't necessarily have the time to focus on those other pieces. So well, what is operations? Isn't it just tech? It's a lot more than that. So education and simulation is part of that larger blue circle up there. So the goal is, in fact, education. That's why we are all here. That's why we're all involved in higher education. But in order to get that process to be available and ready to go, it requires all three of these other pieces on that triangle up there. That there is administrative responsibilities and administrative duties to make sure that we have the correct people and personnel hired, that the uh, equipment is available and functioning, that somebody has coordinated that the classroom is available and isn't double scheduled, and that we have the correct people ready to operate it and support it. And then we also need to have a specialist, a technical um, innovator who is able to sort of improve upon the design of the educational material working with an educator and also be able to troubleshoot and set up and maintain any activities that are getting ready to go on. So all three of these pieces are required for this larger operations role to be able to move forward with any type of education. So I've worked with a, a group of uh, seven individuals uh, creating a set of standards for healthcare simulation <coughs> operations. And I was informed last week that it has finally passed the approval stage by um, an axle. International uh, Nursing Simulation Group that uh, helps to produce standards, and it will be in press within the next month or so. Um, and so I'm going to share some of the highlights of that work um, and what we have been able to uh, sort of put together as a consolidated baseline framework for what you would want to make sure is going on with your center um, to achieve appropriate um, sort of operations background for how you proceed. The first portion of that is the common vision. So this is that any simulation center needs to have or should have a strategic plan, a mission statement, something that is guiding their overall progress forward. And if you don't have this, yes, we can still provide great education, but it helps give direction to how that education is provided, who it's provided for, and what aspects you're focusing on in providing that. So this seems straightforward, but um, if you're trying to provide just education for a, a new learner coming into uh, the world of healthcare, uh, whether it's in, in nursing or a, 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 an undergraduate uh, uh, medical student getting ready to enter residency, um, that the type of education you might provide to those individuals is different than if you're talking about uh, nurses in clinical practice and the type of detail that they may need to be able to advance their knowledge and career. So knowing who your target learners are and what your goal is in providing that education is going to help. This really should be a written statement and passed down to all of those involved with providing that education so that you can make sure that everybody has a common idea of what the goals are within that educational structure. And as you have that common vision, just for any large corporate uh, entity, they have these same guiding principles that help to make sure everybody is on the same page about how they deliver their product and their, and their innovation. The next component of this is, of course, personnel, figuring out who is working where, doing what, and what those expectations are. So we'd like to think that we just pull somebody off the shelf and they're ready to go. They are a cookie cutter um, you know, 
you know, worker, they are a cookie cutter educator, and they're ready to go. But again, based on that mission, based on that vision that you have for your center, each person needs to have a specific niche that they fill. Whether you need somebody that is a clinical educator to help provide better um, education and teaching, versus you have a whole bunch of great educators, but nobody actually knows how to turn on or operate or control the mannequins, then you may need somebody with a more specific simulation background. Or even separate from that, you're getting your program started and you haven't quite gotten your mannequins connected to the network and IT has uh, told you that because they're running a miniature version of Windows that they can't run them without installing an antivirus software that can't actually be installed. And so somebody with all of these potential backgrounds needs to be able to speak those languages and help make sure that the product that's being created matches the educational need and fits in with the larger picture. Simulation takes up a lot of space. It is logistically difficult to manage not just rooms and learner assignments so that you can get people in, give them their orientation, have classroom and didactic activities that then lead into a, uh, a hands-on practical experience, and being able to coordinate that movement within a simulation center. In addition to that, you need to have the technical personnel that are helping out to run the center, that are helping out to run each scenario, that are working with the educators, all available at the same time in the same place without double booking them. And the mannequins are big. They're full-sized humans, and they need to be put somewhere, and each one of them needs to have its own separate set of tools, repair equipment, replacement parts, and so you need to have the space and resources set up to be able to accommodate those needs. So you can see from this picture up here that there is uh, very creative ways for how these uh, mannequins get stored, almost from a sort of catacomb style um, gurney and bed system to full board classrooms. Uh, how do you put the support products, gloves, canisters, IV starts, fully catheters, all of the other pieces that are needed for the educational objectives, and where do they go, and did somebody remember to figure out a place for all of that equipment on the front end? And so somebody with this background and these expertise moving in and helping to run and design simulation centers, make sure that these problems are addressed on the front end and aren't retrofit later. The big one, of course, with anything is finance. As you are all very much aware, uh, money drives everything in business, in education, and in life. And so you have a mannequin that costs $85,000. It has a $20,000 warranty that needs to be upgraded every uh, five years. And then somebody needs to also hire an individual that's able to support and maintain that in addition to all of the other equipment. So are you thinking ahead about knowing how to manage those uh, financial resources, figuring out a process to figure out what resources are being utilized and doing a resource utilization evaluation for the simulation that you provide. Is somebody keeping track that this mannequin was used five times last year and was used an hour each time and this mannequin was used twice a week for three hours and when it comes time to support the warranty, this one needs to be kept up. We don't care about this one. It's a great mannequin, but we just don't use it enough to, to need it. And having that type of knowledge and background moving forward for planning and uh, improving your simulation center and making sure that it is sustainable financially. Also, tracking what resources are lacking to prevent you from reaching that common goal, that common mission. And so you know what personnel need to be hired uh, a lot of programs and a lot of higher education have great money and grants available for getting capital equipment, but there is always a fight to get personnel that are trained, sustainable, and then of course providing continuous training even after they've come in with an appropriate background to keep them up to date moving forward with all of the new technology and innovation that's occurring. I've been involved with the simulation center I'm at for five years. 
In that time, I think each major mannequin manufacturer has come out with three full upgrades and updates to their software that required the training of everybody involved and required us to redo our networking and computer infrastructure at least twice. So did we remember to plan for all of those technical upgrades in the financial management up front? Not necessarily because we wanted to think that it was going to stay integrated and stay functional, but being able to have the foresight to keep ready for all of those changes that are coming down and make sure that the larger institutional stakeholders remember that this is not a one and done um, investment and there needs to be a plan for sustainability. Systems integration. So this is the other major component. Um, that is uh, image up here, just to I'll give you some context, is the first about 10 to 15 feet of a particle accelerator out of Oak Ridge National Laboratories. Um, I had the opportunity to work on this as an intern project in my undergraduate career and was involved with constructing and designing a magnet about this large that would measure the particle that passed through there for calibration. That about one square foot component that I was working on was one piece of a mile long track. And so what I did, although a small component, was actually an integral part of this larger need. So the analogy over to the healthcare system is we have paramedics, we have nurses, we have pharmacy, we have physicians, we have physical therapy, we have all of these pieces that help come together to provide patient care on a larger sense. And how are the training activities for each of those individuals occurring to fit into this larger healthcare need? And what are the needs of regional and national healthcare systems to help make sure we have the correct personnel available and trained? We've heard that there's going to be shortages on just about every possible aspect of healthcare personnel moving forward. And what are individual groups doing to address those needs and find out which specific areas are needing better training? And so this is part of that larger need is looking at the systems integration of how your training and your education fits into the need of the community and the larger region. So the operations and technology specialist is really in charge of everything except for maybe the educational content itself. But they are in charge of logistics supervision, make sure that scheduling and room arrangements are ready, that periodic maintenance is performed on the mannequins, and that they are set up and maintained to function and work correctly. That they work for cost containment and are suggesting the most cost-effective methods for providing that education. Somebody comes in and wants to run a scenario teaching education about um, CPR training, maybe the recessa ante is actually the cheapest and most effective means for providing that specific education and the wear and tear on the $85,000 mannequin isn't needed for this particular activity. But understanding what the educational need and understanding the educational objectives and being able to make appropriate recommendations when the educator may not have enough time or expertise to be able to focus on simulation specific technology available to them. Uh, data collection. So how will you know that your education is effective? Who's collecting the pre and post exams? Who's following up to make sure that the amount of time that everybody is spending in the um, encounter is being recorded so that you know what resources you need to make sure you ask for in the future? It, if you need uh, six hours of educator time to be able to conduct a scenario because it took two hours at the beginning and two hours at the end to set up process, update material, and then grade and review the performance, but you only encountered the two hours that the scenario actually took place, are you going to be able to appropriately request the resources needed for a larger scale and continuous operation? So all of these things need to be captured and collected, and this operation specialist is that administrator, is that coordinator, in addition to the technical specialist that's going to help collect and maintain this information. They're also going to be the ones that actually have the time and ability, hopefully, to get people called, get them scheduled, have them come in and do a, a run-through of your uh, simulation before it actually occurs so that you find all of the little kinks, figure out which images need to be improved, find out that the mannequin needs to be programmed a little bit differently than the educator may have thought on the front end. And all of this needs to be set up in advance 
and it's its own special set of skills that does not exist in training programs right now. So who is helping to make sure that somebody knows how to create a scenario, how to appropriately utilize the equipment available in a center? Is the educator really the best person to stay up to date on all of the components for new and novel and up-to-date clinical practice, as well as what equipment is stored in the closets to know how to appropriately use it for the education that's being provided. And that is where the next component comes in, which is integration and innovation. If you have pieces that you're trying to provide, that you're trying to educate with, that aren't currently produced commercially, how do you identify those needs? And how do you create something to meet your educational objective? There's been a push now to find the innovation component in this group of individuals that actually have an engineering background or an innovation background to look at something and say, hey, we can do better than this. This mannequin's fantastic, but what it really should be able to do is this, and then provide that innovation on top of it to meet an educational need. Now, I've talked to um, these some of the larger simulation corporations and, and asked them about certain products and about certain innovations, and they've said, well, yeah, that's a great idea, but we only have a market that would have about a thousand of those produced, and so it's not cost effective for us to create a whole line of products related to that. So who is producing that smaller niche market, that niche product to help with education that's needed if it's not coming from a corporation? It's going to have to be created on a smaller institutional level. And those with a background in engineering and in simulation together are going to be able to meet that need. And I'll show you some examples of where this can go. So technology is a fantastic tool. And we use it every day. Everybody's got a phone with them. Everybody's got a laptop. Uh, we probably all used at least 20 forms of technology at some point today already just to arrive and be where we are. Now, what determines how we're going to decide what new technology is being created and how we're going to advance and integrate it into our lives? Because every new app, every update, requires us to change something about the way we function, the way we interact with it. And so what determines how we interact with all of these new products, all these new innovations, and which ones are going to succeed and be wonderful and indispensable to our daily functioning, and which ones are we going to say, uh, it's kind of cool, but I don't really have time to learn that. It's not really adding that much to my life. So this um, technology acceptance model was produced in the 19. Um, 80s and validated really some of the technology being produced with computers and innovation then, and found a few key components related to uh, perceived ease of usefulness and the uh, required time and expense to learn how to use it and whether it was really going to be effective and how other people perceived it to know whether it needed to be adopted and put into practice. And it helps to provide a pretty good conceptual framework for why people chose to take technology and adapt it to their life and continue using it. They attempted to look at this at physicians um, in particular. So, sorry, I'm getting a little bit ahead. The, the common example of uh, something that we think of today that's a fairly new innovation that many of us now are able to integrate with almost no additional thought is something like this. It's simple, it's straightforward, a single app, and it's relatively intuitive, but it is very easy to use, took a low learning curve, and has provided great use, especially if you travel or are in large cities and don't want to deal with uh, public transit and, and taxis. When this was applied to the physician sector, they looked at it um, in Asia for telemedicine among physicians. And uh, one item that I found particularly interesting in this model, so they looked at the correlation from each of these components and how it led to an actual movement forward to adoption of use. I want you to pay attention to this bottom corner here, perceived ease of use is the lowest component of the actual adoption of telemedicine for physicians. Now, is this because the physician is just such a technical expert that they just don't need to worry about it. They've got it all figured out. I don't think so, speaking as a physician. 
Uh, I'm guessing it's because they have a team of 15 people that they expect to be trailing behind them that are going to set up, fix, and maintain it for them. And so who is actually going to be doing that in other areas where physicians and high level educators are involved and they don't necessarily think they're going to be involved with that layer of it. So now we're going to talk about some of the innovations and some of the tools that are available to us in simulation. So 3D printing has of course become a big popular topic um, all over the place and it's great for being able to uh, create little uh, trinkets to put on your desk and to find that little plastic clip that broke that nobody seems to sell anymore and to rapidly prototype and develop new products. Well, it's also useful for creating um, one-off products that are needed to fill a specific need. So I was talking about talking with corporations and manufacturers to produce educational tools. One particular need I have as an educator in emergency medicine is creating a task trainer to teach our residents how to appropriately diagnose and treat priapism. Um, if you are from a healthcare background, you know what this is. Um, if you are not, and you've ever seen a commercial that says that um, if you've had a certain condition lasting longer than four hours, you should seek medical attention, um, you'll get a better idea of what it is. But these do come into the emergency department. They're considered a urologic emergency and are in the realm of treatment for urologists specifically, unless you don't have one on call in your small emergency department, or they're on vacation that day, or they're out on the golf course and can't make it in in the next couple of hours. So I needed a way of training my residents in how to perform this procedure, because the watch one, do one, teach one is not always the best approach and I can actually tell you from my own training, I didn't even get the wash one. <laughs> but when it came in, I had to provide treatment on it, and that's where I realized this need existed. But when talking with the corporations that manufactured training tools like this, this was exactly the example. They took it to their, um, their research and design people and said, well, yeah, we can make one, but we just wouldn't make any money on it. So, this is an example of utilization of 3D printing to create that need. So the part in the bottom right looks like a little radioactive sim uh, symbol is the uh, skeletal structure to outline the uh, two um, corpus cavernosum on uh, the shaft of the penis and at the base of the uh, urethra that would pass through where the urine goes. This was created on both ends and from the dollar store, a couple of party balloons strung through with simulated blood. On the base, there was a foam, uh, uh, a foam sponge placed, and the entire item was wrapped inside of a fake skin and applied to the uh, pelvic region on a mannequin. They were able to appropriately evaluate, provide nerve injection, and then actually aspirate and achieve the tumescence of this condition on the mannequin for training. So this item took about three dollars to make, could be shared anywhere in the world that has family dollar, and is able to be used for training emergency physicians, urologists, anywhere that wants such. Three D printing can also be used to apply to actual medical care. And there are tools that allow you to take the DICOM, which is radiographic images from real CT and MRI data, and produce 3D models of the structures found inside of those. So you can create 3D models of pathologic conditions and then demonstrate them in a real setting for learners to kind of understand. And they've also been able to use this for surgeons to be able to plan uh, procedures. And knowing how to appropriately take these images and convert them into 3D printable models uh, does take some skill, but there's lots of tools out there that help people to achieve this type of innovation. There's a couple of other pieces that I want to talk about here. So virtual reality. Does everybody know what virtual reality is? Does everybody know what augmented reality is? And does your answer to the first one change after I ask the second one? So virtual reality is the creation of a completely artificial, three-dimensional environment with which you can interact. 
This is achieved usually with a pair of stereoscopic goggles, projects an independent image to each eye, gives you the uh, perception of 3D depth. We've had this around uh, since about the late 1800s, early 1900s in the World's Fair, so they figured out they could draw pictures that were just a little bit off from one another, put them in a viewfinder that separated the field of view, and you got a three-dimensional effect. This was actually popularized for home use with slide projectors and slide cameras in the 1950s, um, all the way through about the 1970s. People could take their own dual image family photos and then put them in a slide projector with a background, and you could have three-dimensional family photos. This converted into the toy of the 1980s and earlier with the viewfinder. You pull a little lever and you get a rotating disc with backlight, and suddenly Mickey Mouse had three-dimensional ears, and it was a phenomenal toy. This fell off because it, I mean, they still exist, but it never really gained great popularity. Nintendo tried to create the Virtual Boy in the late 1990s. It was their worst selling video game system. People got a headache from looking at lasers being shined at their eyes at an increasingly awkward refresh rate, and it never caught on. Now come to our smartphone era where everybody in their pocket has a processor and machine fast enough to produce high definition virtual reality images with uh, sorry, with uh, movement capability so that as you turn, twist, and move, the image moves almost imperceptibly and it takes several hours before people get a headache and have to take the equipment off. But it's now at a point where it is a fully functional piece of equipment that we carry with us and is cost effective. So how is this being used in simulation? Well, some larger centers have been able to integrate this into virtual operating rooms where they can actually um, have individuals standing together, tracking motion around a room so they know where each other are, and pass virtual instruments back and forth. I've been able to use this in my own center. Uh, so medical residency, we have to uh, talk to and bring in a new group of medical residents every year to fill our training program. We get about 700 applications for our program uh, for 12 spots. We are able to whittle that down to about 120 that get brought into interview and from that I'm supposed to in the period of a few hours figure out whether they're going to be acceptable emergency medicine physicians. Well, there's not a whole lot of great criteria that we've been able to figure out other than that the personality is probably really important. We'd like them to have uh, the ability to be conscientious, clear communicators, and actually their medical background knowledge may not be all that important because we can teach them, and that's the whole point of the next three years. But what we can't teach them is what they should have learned in kindergarten, which is how to say please and thank you. So <laughs> I have taken the virtual reality concept and applied it into our interviewing practice. Now as the residents come in, they're sat down next to two or three of their colleagues that they've never met before, but they might work with, and they are given an instructional video for five minutes saying that they will be working with the team member sitting next to them to diffuse a virtual bomb. One of them is placed inside a VR helmet, and the other is given a manual of instructions on how to diffuse that bomb. The person inside the helmet can see nothing but the bomb, the person with the manual can see nothing but the manual. I get to see them talk to one another, figure out how they interact with technology, which they will be doing now and for the rest of their lives, whether they wanted to or not, thanks to the electronic health record. And I can see whether they communicate, start cursing, and during the interview, they will actually remove jackets, take off ties, because they're playing a video game and not involved in an interview. So I get a chance to see their underlying personality a lot more clearly than if they're just sitting there answering the question of why they wanted to be in an emergency position. Augmented reality is a separate version of this, where a three-dimensional computer graphic image is projected on top of an existing fixed structure that is in actual reality. So this may seem like a, a strange differentiation, but the idea here is the concept that was introduced with Google Glass before people decided that it looked too creepy to make it useful. And that is that there was a computer overlay image that was projected out on top of the existing environment. We can do this with our phones as well because the camera will capture the actual environment around and then we'll be able to project a computer generated image on top of it, potentially based on key points. So you can even keep the orientation appropriate and walk around a virtual mannequin that's produced and placed out onto the gurney. 
the, there was a company um, out of uh, Stanford that had a medical student that actually pioneered and innovated an entire set of virtual patients called SimX that is, does just that. So you, your Sim lab is just a bunch of empty beds, and you walk around with a set of glasses, you can interact with the real environment, and there is now a computer-generated image of the mannequin that will move, screen, and have rashes and other findings present on it. I'll show you a few more examples of that moving forward. So how are we obtaining all of this stuff? Well, you can also do it with uh, video imagery. So video cameras are able to project now a, uh, an image in front of us, and we are left to see only what is on that image. And it is a way of having the filmmaker be able to guide us. And just by showing us what's on screen, add importance to those items that they want us to pay attention to. Well, what if you're in the middle of a code situation and you're trying to figure out where your learners are looking and what they need to be paying attention to inside of a hospital setting? If you show them exactly what you want, you're not getting a chance to see where they're getting distracted and know how to educate them. But if you were to hang an a, uh, equirectangular video camera from the middle of a room, it is a camera, the simplest version basically has uh, two signs that have these even for use with uh, cell phones. Um, the slightly more um, high quality ones have six cameras basically pointed at each wall of the inside of a cube is the best way I can uh, describe it. And then all six of those images are stitched together until it looks something like this when projected out onto a flat piece of paper. So it kind of looks like a globe that's been expanded out. And when the appropriate hardware, in this case, even your cell phone or a virtual reality headset is worn. Anywhere that you look will look as though you were looking in that spot to begin with. And so you can use this as a way of running learners through the exact same scenario over and over again so that they know whether to be paying attention to the vital signs on the board, the person placing the procedure right there that is doing it incorrectly, or figuring out whether the new person in the back of the room that came in was actually the anesthesiologist and shouldn't have sent to the head of the bed doing intubation. And it allows you to, in a controlled environment, put people through the same scenario over and over again and provide education and training based on that. Our medical students, even at our own institution, are not allowed inside of the room during the level one trauma <coughs> because there are too many people already in there. And that's wonderful. We're encouraging good patient care and we don't want extra people in the way. But how are they ever going to gain the experience necessary to provide better medical education and here after they graduate if they've never been allowed in the room. So that brings us to the actual design of scenarios. So you're going to be creating these immersive environments and simulation design should not just be how many times the ACLS scenario was run and do you remember how to do compressions and how to do ventilation. We figured that out and we've done that with the, like I said, with Sessa Annie for the last 20 to 30 year, more years. So staging, scripting, and immersive environments can be created with simulation, but you have to have knowledge of how to create Lumash and how to stage and script things so that it provides learners with challenging situations that they may have to encounter in real life. <clears throat> so in this image here, we're creating a simulated burn on this patient uh, to help draw people's attention so that they know that what they're supposed to be focusing on in terms of care and management. Uh, but it's important to remember that whatever you're creating in these artificial environments has to go back to and match with the learning objectives for the scenario that you're running. It's not just that we have the ability to do this, it's that it somehow impacts and enhances the learning that's already being provided. So here's an example of a high stress simulation that was created at our center where the entire goal was to uh, let people know what it was like in a disaster situation where they might have multiple patients in each room and figuring out how to improve communication between these patients. So you can see the sort of chaos that's occurring, um, even simple things like placement of a C collar, which should be uh, almost required no thought for a uh, emergency medicine resident. They were putting it off backwards and upside down because they were so confused by everything else that was going on that they were forgetting simple little things. And this particular case was designed uh, so that 
about five minutes into caring for the initial patient, a second patient is wheeled into the room and placed next to the mother. So this is a pediatric patient on the, the side there, um, the mom on the right from a disaster that has occurred. And as they're beginning to perform the intubation on this child, their mannequin has been modified to have pulmonary edema. Their, this scenario involved an organophosphate poisoning the sporting arena, and there is an aquarium pump underneath the bed on this mannequin. As they're wheeled into the room, a remote switch will start that aquarium pump, push air into a soap-filled container that has a tube run up through a aquarium stone that creates froth, and copious foam begins appearing out of the mouth of the mannequin. All the residents who remember that there is oxygen suction at the head of the bed but have never used it, now are required to actually figure out how to hook up and suction that patient before they can ever get a view of the airway to even perform the intubation. So it is creating engaging environments that force your residents to not just stand at the head of the bed and say, so next I would uh, intubate the patient. That's not it. We're not creating a tabletop exercise. We're creating a hands-on engaging learning environment. Task trainers are a whole separate product that we have to work with. It's smaller scale, specific features that are designed to train a single skill. They can be added as part of a hybrid simulation into a larger scenario. So you can have a full mannequin that's coming in after a trauma and a car accident and has bruising moulage on the side of their chest. And the residents want to rush in, the providers, the paramedics, the flight crews, whoever you're training, want to place that chest. Well, that's great. The high fidelity mannequins, despite the fact that they are designed to be able to accommodate chest tubes, don't actually teach that skill anatomically very correctly. Um, some of the mannequins have a single hole that is already placed for you. You just stub the tube in, but it doesn't teach you any of the technical skill for how to prep the tree, identify landmarks and make a cut, poke through the muscle wall, and place that tube. And so a task trainer is actually a better skill. Many of the task trainers for these, this particular device uh, cost between five dollars and $10,000, and a replacement skin set, which will get you about four cuts, is $50 per skin. So if you're trying to train a bunch of learners, and say you have 36 residents every year, that cost is going to add up very quickly. But the important part of this skill is making the cut, dissecting down through the tissue, and puncturing through that muscle, and you know how much force to apply and how to prevent your instruments from going in too deeply. This product was created using PVC pipe from Home Depot, a 2x6, and a piece of plywood. It was sent out with uh, laser cut silicone foam from a gasket manufacturer to 10 EM residency programs around the country. Every single one of those programs rated it at least as good or better than their existing trainer, which I assume to be the one I was just describing. It also costs about $8 to get six, four to six residents to train on a fresh cut of skin. This can be fit into a suitcase and you can manufacture the entire frame device for about $10. I share an office with um, an MD, PhD who has a background in uh, physical um, and mechanical engineering, and we were noticing that standardized patients are a fantastic use in creating engaging scenarios, but they have certain limitation, and that is that their physiology is the physiology that they represent. They have some fancy uh, what are called cut suits where you can practice trauma surgery on a patient who's sitting and screaming. Um, by wearing a device that fits over the patient. But that's a utility specific to trauma and may not be applicable to all aspects. And it's also about a $70,000 piece of equipment that you cut into and then have to repair. So there's other ways of improving the quality of innovation that goes on with standardized patients. Using a couple of cell phone speakers rigged to a pulse generator, we were able to get palpable pulses in a wearable device that can be applied to any standardized patient to practice abnormal heart rhythm evaluation and be able to actually have novel pathology present where it wasn't previously present. So one of the other places that we're going to be going with this but has not yet reached its, uh, it, it's probably final uh, piece is haptic. So how do you interact with these virtual worlds? and get real feedback for what we're touching and encountering. 
to have to exist the idea that when you're in a virtual space and you're reaching out into an open environment, how do you know that what you're grabbing onto is what you're grabbing onto? Does it feel and interact directly? The term used for this right now in a lot of simulation is called fidelity. And there's been a bunch of complaints about the use of that word, and it may be best in terms um, affordance or what does the device actually provide in terms of its innovation and feedback. But I prefer thinking about it as high feedback. So it is that what you touch provides you some type of realistic feedback to its environment or to its function. So haptics is the idea that there are going to be ways of wearing small sensors to provide touch, vibration, temperature, return, either to your body or specifically to your hands to help train with procedures.